This video is brought to you by my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to support this channel and long-form videos like this, consider becoming a patron today. Is it just me, or is Jon Stewart viral all the time? If you didn't know, he returned to TV last fall with his new show, The Problem with Jon Stewart, and between that and the accompanying podcast, he's been hearing it from all corners of the internet. He's gone soft. He's not funny anymore. He looks old. I don't mean to say has time passed you by, but you were talking about a different. <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about That's a quite different a throw era. Away. Is is has time um, has, has, you has by? You How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? I love the young people. At the same time, we've got an entire other corner of the internet clamoring for him to run for office and praising his new show for exposing the. F in my last video, I pointed out how the Jon Stewart we remember might never have actually existed, our memories serving as rose-colored glasses for the lost champion of liberals everywhere. I found that there were definitely problems with his approach, but it didn't really answer how or why he feels different now. And there's a really easy answer for that. It's because I needed to make you watch another video. Take that, algorithm. <laughs> I also just ran out of time. <laughs> you don't have to watch that first video to get this one by any means. I think this stands on its own, but if you do want to watch it, I'm not going to stop you. In this video, though, I want to finish off this conversation about Jon Stewart. And that way, you can finally stop tagging me in that climate change clip from his show. Yes, I've seen it. And so what I'm saying is co-opt whatever their greed principle is to make it so that they own this transition or at least part of it. There's too much money involved, and so in some ways, we have to bribe them. Bribe them. You know what? It's not even the cringiest thing he says in that episode. Still, I think that there's a lot we can actually learn from the problem with Jon Stewart. Not what the show actually says so much, but importantly, all the things that it doesn't say. Because the real problem with Jon Stewart is also the problem with politics, the media, and the prevailing ideology that has dominated American politics for the last 40 years. The real problem? Jon Stewart doesn't get capitalism. We are under the illusion that we live in a free market capitalist system. And we in no way live in a free market capitalist system. This idea of a free and fair marketplace can be exploited by those who, where greed might be more of a motivating factor. Okay, it, so then it's not a free market because the only reason there's this much churn is the Federal Reserve has hyperinflated the stock market. This sounds like the mafia. This doesn't, this isn't, <laughs> this isn't free market capitalism. Like. So let's talk about Jon Stewart. Why his new show feels so tone deaf, why he feels out of touch and why maybe we don't need him anymore. Let's spend just a minute talking about the problem with Jon Stewart as a TV show. You might have seen some clips without having watched an episode, so here's just a crash course. Every episode follows a fairly strict format, although they're all variable episodes in length. The first segment sees Stewart introduce the problem from behind a desk. It's like looking in a mirror, isn't it? Trying to break off huge, massive topics like climate change, freedom, the economy, the stock market, guns, media, and war into much smaller topics that he can actually tackle in that episode. This is the part of the show where Stuart looks the most stewardy, and generally is the least interesting part of the show. In weird twist, Stuart's doing his best John Oliver impersonation, who started his hosting career by doing a John Stewart impersonation on The Daily Show. So it's like a weird mirror image of a Xerox copy of a mirror image Xerox copy. We'll talk more about John Oliver later, but Stewart's approach here has far less depth, despite being focused on subjects that require way more exploration and context. This is also the part of the show that features the most jokes, which is not necessarily a good thing. It has stolen our freedom to send our kids to school, to exhale in a Starbucks, to kiss the chef on the lips after a delicious meal. Oh, Carmine. Your eggplant rollatini moves me. <laughs> After that opening segment, Stuart brings on a panel to discuss the problem that he's brought up in the opening of the episode before pivoting to the final act of the show, where he confronts someone who is in a position of power in regards to the problem he's discussing, and that's when he gets you. And so, I mean, laws that are oftentimes written by the very people you're trying to regulate. No, they're written by Congress. 
written by the very people you're trying to regulate. Because who do you think writes the laws for Congress on financial instruments? It's this last section where I want to start this breakdown. Because back when he was on The Daily Show, Jon Stewart built a reputation for speaking truth to power, for calling out politicians and media members for their lies and hypocrisy. Now, calling out hypocrisy like this has its own issues, and we covered that in the last video, but there were times when it was undeniably effective. Mm -hmm. I am trying to expose this stuff, exactly what you guys do, and I'm trying to get the regulators to look at well, it. Well, see, that's interesting. Roll 210. Sure. I would encourage anyone who's in the hedge fund to do it, because it's legal, right. and it, uh, it is a very quick way to make money, and very satisfying. Okay. Um, well, but by the way, no one else in the world would ever admit that, but I can care. That's right, and you can say that here. I can't, I'm not going to say it on TV. It's on TV now. I want the Jim Cramer on CNBC to protect me from that Jim Cramer. This interview with Jim Cramer has always stuck in my mind as the epitome of Stewart's righteous fury, the shining example of him speaking truth to power. You see, in the fallout of the 2008 financial crisis, Stewart brought on Jim Cramer, host of CNBC's Mad Money, a show that tracked the stock market in a style that was eccentric. I'm, I'm gonna go with ex I'm gonna go with eccentric. I'm going over the top right here. Buy, 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 really bad advice to their audience leading up to the financial crisis. Should I be worried about Bear Stearns in terms of liquidity and get my money out of there? No, no, no. All while knowing that the bubble was about to burst, Stewart brought on Kramer and held his feet to the fire. Listen, you knew what the banks were doing and yet were touting it for months and months. The entire network was. And so now to pretend that this was some sort of crazy once in a lifetime tsunami that nobody could have seen coming, is disingenuous at best and criminal at worst. As far as I can tell, this is one of, if not the first time Stewart held an extended interview with a guest, devoting more than his usual five minutes to an issue so that they could discuss it in more detail. This was something that would become a staple of The Daily Show in the years that followed, often with the extended portions of the interviews finding their way to the show's website. And for an audience frustrated with the rampant corruption and greed that the financial crisis exposed, the way Stewart attacked Kramer was very therapeutic. You all know. But you all know what's going on. You know, you can draw a straight line from those shenanigans to the stuff that was being pulled at Bayer and at AIG and all this derivative market stuff that is this weird Wall Street side bet. And I'm speaking right. purely as a layman. It feels like we are capitalizing your adventure by our pension and our harder and that it is uh, a game that you know that you know is going on but that you go on television as a financial network and pretend isn't happening finally someone said it <sighs> mad money's still on the air by the way and jim kramer hosts it he's gotten a little bit better at holding companies accountable oh oh, oh wait is that a video of him giving Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos a platform to lie? Never mind. <laughs> Jim Cramer has now actually been on the air hosting that show longer than Stewart hosted The Daily Show. So, you know, it's not like Jon Stewart ended his career or anything. This baby, this stock is born to run. Someone should question him publicly. Between his criticisms of the Bush administration and confronting both Jim Cramer and Tucker Carlson, Jon Stewart started to be seen not just as a clever comedian, but as someone who could and would speak truth to power. And this is often the best part of the problem with Jon Stewart, these closing interviews where Stewart pleads with those in charge to take their job seriously. I, You're the cop. I understand that. I understand that, but you also want somebody in my role to be successful at being a cop. Oh my lord. Stewart is excellent at finding questions that lead his subjects into word salads, scrambling to find some kind of thing to say while also revealing nothing. Why can't you define those rules? I, I, I'm sorry, I wish I could and uh, you know, maybe but that's my weakness. How do you know when you've achieved them? By, because, because we have a series of 
uh, requirements that we have to meet that we've been running against for years. And what we've been what doing is running against them, we've been running against them with one strain of information that comes from the National Academies of Science. Right, which is paid for and by what, the VA, and, and, and the information I, comes from DOD. Yeah, it was words. Words are just, uh, what, nothing. Complicated airflow. He calls out these authorities to their faces for the lies they tell to obscure the real way Washington operates. You're telling me that financial institutions, large financial institutions, don't lobby Congress on the well, writing they, they of those regulations. John, so they who, absolutely, they well, lobby. Well, that's what I'm asking you. They have, they have of course. Uh, an ability to get meetings. Oh, absolutely. So the laws that Congress writes are manipulated and coerced. Those are your words. While I remember Stewart's interviews through the lens of that Jim Cramer one, most of his interviews on The Daily Show weren't that great. He really didn't do that much in the way of questioning authority and often legitimized bad faith actors. But you've clearly never seen my show. I do terrible interviews routinely. Here's John interviewing and legitimizing Eric Prince, the CEO of Blackwater, a mercenary group that committed war crimes in Iraq. Get the fuck out. Can I tell you something? <laughs> there is a kid up there who's a traitor. <laughs> Finance? You want to work with this cat? Yeah. Here's John interviewing Condoleezza Rice, not once, but twice after the Bush administration, allowing her to peddle lies about the invasion of Iraq while selling her book. Do you understand what I'm no, saying? I do. The United I States do. did a preemptive we no, went to war without we, being attacked. I would not call this preemptive when you have oh. 16 Security Council oh. resolutions that say that he's a threat to international peace well, and look, security. Look. And here he is doing the same thing with former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld in 2011. You push so hard to make it happen. We'll come back to that, but I don't think it's correct to say we pushed hard to make it happen. This happened to me with Rumsfeld. <gasps> and like right at the beginning of the conversation, I go, so when you guys were selling the war, well, we didn't sell it, we presented a case. Well, you presented all the positive cases, and not, that's a sales job. No, I didn't really, it's uh, presented the case. But I had such an intention that I was like, oh, fuck that, let's just move on. And that night, I realized, oh, that was the essence of the entire conversation. I think I lost more sleep over that interview than he lost over the entire war. His friendship and consistent interviews with Bill O'Reilly are a prime example, and something that he's named as his biggest regret from his tenure on The Daily Show. So, to Stewart's credit, he's really improved a lot as an interviewer, and he's platforming activists in panels, and in those more antagonistic interviews, he's better at holding a firm line of questioning. So, why does it still feel off? You know, they say that free market Capitalism is the best way to deliver prosperity and growth and the most efficient way to distribute uh, that prosperity throughout a population. So I guess my question is, when can we have a free market capitalist system in this country? Stewart is challenging people in power, but not power itself. And I think this is because of Stewart's approach to these discussions one where he tries to find common ground by using the conventional presentation of an issue. On the problem with Jon Stewart, Stewart's acceptance of the pre-existing framing of an issue often makes him blind to larger systemic issues. Take his very first episode, one titled The Problem with War. What, what could it be? <laughs> What's the problem with war, John? I, I don't know. <laughs> just one? Just one problem? Just one problem with war? Okay. Okay. <laughs> There's so many to pick from. <laughs> Despite the sweeping title, the episode really focuses on something called burn pits, where literal tons of debris, trash, and toxic waste from the machinery of war are dumped and then lit on fire in war zones like Iraq and Afghanistan. The most powerful and lavishly funded technologically sophisticated military apparatus in the world got rid of their trash the same way Jake Paul does. Oh wow. Oh god, it's already in flames. Oh my god. Oh, god. They're awful. They're they suck. And have caused massive health problems for the soldiers exposed to them. All while the VA refuses to pay for their medical bills. This delay is killing people. I mean I think it's I, I, I that's not hyperbole. Now, 
This is very similar to a cause that Stewart passionately argued for in his time after The Daily Show, the 9-11 First Responders Bill, where those who pulled bodies out of the rubble on September 11th got sick from the cleanup process and exposure to toxic chemicals. These first responders were left to die from those health conditions because they couldn't pay for expensive medical treatment. And when funding ran out for the bill in 2019, Stewart went to Congress and called out the legislators. There is not a person here, there is not an empty chair on that stage that didn't tweet out, never forget the heroes of 9-11, never forget their bravery, never forget what they did, what they gave to this country. Well, here they are. And where are they? And it would be one thing if their callous indifference and rank hypocrisy were benign, but it's not. Your indifference costs these men and women their most valuable commodity, time. The very next day, the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund was permanently reauthorized in a unanimous vote. This was a real and effective example of speaking truth to power, and I think that with this burn pit episode, Stewart is aiming to do the same thing, to call out legislators on an issue everyone can agree on, protecting our troops. Let's try something bipartisan and non-controversial. Veterans. Military Appreciation Night presented by Pacific Premier Bank. Thank you for your service. We thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. Oh, thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. The Price is Right salutes our troops. I love you all. Kissy, kissy. But I think that there's a really key difference between the 9-11 first responders and the American troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that would be why they were there. Now look, I'm not here to relitigate the wars in Afghanistan or Iraq or United States global military presence, or how so many large corporations have a vested interest in war so that they can sell more weapons, or how the United States has used these wars to secure oil markets. If, if you do want that, you can watch my video on the Marvel Cinematic Universe called Team America World Police. Regardless of how you feel about the wars in the Middle East, they were bad. Stewart's focus on veterans is certainly a worthy cause. And I understand trying to spotlight small things that you can actually potentially change. I also understand that Stewart isn't asking for the world here. He's just asking lawmakers to do what they said they would. And let's just let it be said that since the airing of that episode, Stewart has had an effect. On March 3rd, the House of Representatives passed a bill aimed to help veterans exposed to burn pits. It was opposed by 174 Republicans, and we'll see what happens in the Senate, but that's not nothing. But all of this accepts a certain framing of the world. One where American wars of aggression are just an immutable fact of life. In that world, we're left trying to make sure thousands of Americans can get medical treatment for the deadly toxins they're exposed to, instead of maybe not doing the wars that necessitate burn pits in the first place. Just a thought. Just th I'm just, I'm spitballing here, guys. And this framing also focuses the audience's attention on American costs of war not on the millions of Iraqis and Afghans who live next to those burn pits. Also, you know what might solve this VA issue? Universal healthcare or Medicare for all. You see, the plight of the American troops exposed to burn pits is downstream of so many other issues. America's self-image as global police, the environmental cost of the United States military, and the richest country in the world's unwillingness to care for the health of its own people. But the problem with Jon Stewart accepts this worldview and tries to operate within it. He doesn't spend any time putting into context those bigger issues. So you have to ask yourself, what authority is Stewart really challenging? This is also like the best episode of The Problem with Jon Stewart on an issue that's directly in his wheelhouse. Let's take a look at his episode on climate change, which is, uh, it's, it's much more frustrating. Let's, we're doing the climate change episode. A hundred of these companies create 70% of our, of our global emissions. Wouldn't it be better to hold our noses, to not villainize them, to understand that no industry is ever going to cut its own throat and take away its profits? How do we bribe them? In The Problem with Climate Change, Stewart orients his conversation about the issue this way. The scale of the solutions we're being pitched does not match the scale of the problem at hand. On the one hand, we're told how catastrophic climate change is, but we're asked to put our plastic bottles in plastic bins or turn off our lights more often. Recycling doesn't work. 
But if every single person did it, uh -huh. it would do something. It would do nothing. It wouldn't do nothing. It wouldn't solve it the would problem. Do something. First, in 40 years, we've only recycled about 10% of the plastic we use. But what it does, it makes us feel good. Dopamine. Right. So we recycle and we're good people. It's worse for the environment. Because it's making you Because think. we're not fixing the problem. <laughs> wow. <laughs> And I think many of us know that individual responsibility is not going to cut it when it comes to carbon emissions. Just 100 companies are responsible for 71% of global emissions. And 50% of emissions since 1988 can be traced to 25 companies. To Stewart's credit, he does a great job of foregrounding how ineffective these individual approaches are. You're telling us the world is ending. The temperature is going up a trillion degrees. We're all going to be underwater and on fire at the same time. But all you need to do is put a little piece of paper green foot right next to the light. No, no, not all the lights, just half the lights. Here's another little green footprint. And he also does a great job of reminding us that the conversation around lowering your personal carbon footprint was pitched by fossil fuel companies to deflect scrutiny. You see, it turns out fossil fuels popularized the carbon footprint so that we would blame ourselves instead of them. But big oil didn't just popularize the carbon footprint. Recycling, our most treasured act of environmentalism, was another ploy pushed by big oil. But here's the thing. The way Stewart frames this conversation still focuses mainly around how we can get fossil fuel companies to fix the problem they've made, while simultaneously admitting that there's no way they'll ever cut their own profits. I guess my point is, I don't know of a business in the history, certainly not one that's been as profitable for as long as it has as the fossil fuel industry, that cuts its own throat. Stewart's idea is to find some way to co-opt profit incentives against fossil fuel companies in a kind of judo move. I was thinking in terms of judo. Can we use that energy that governments and corporations are, too, are being too slow to act? And we have to find a way to get this thing kickstarted. Again, the issue here is framing. I don't think it's crazy to think of climate change as a referendum on capitalism. Valuing profit over the welfare of the planet is exactly why this mess has continued despite the fact that these corporations have known about, and have been covering up, climate change research for nearly half a decade. The issue is that when profit is the only thing that matters, this is the final result. So it's kind of wild to think that fossil fuel companies chasing profits can be our ticket out of this mess. Stewart's idea is that we can shame them for it, make them accountable for the future, and make them realize that the future won't be kind to fossil fuels. But these people have so much power and wealth now that I'm not sure why they would ever feel shame or care about the future. I mean, these are really wealthy old guys. They, they don't care, dude. Diane Feinstein is essentially on our side, and she told those Sunrise kids to get lost. The government and is supposed to be for the people and by the people, and... All you know what's people. interesting about this group is I've been doing this for 30 years. I know what I'm doing. You come in here and you say it has to be my way or the highway. I don't respond to that. Meanwhile, during the entire 51 minute runtime of the episode and the 40 minute conversation with Kendra Pierre Lewis on his bonus podcast, Stuart never discusses this little thing called the Green New Deal. You know, something that could use massive government intervention to provide a profit incentive to move away from fossil fuels. Just never once. Nobody brings it up. Not once. It's just... It doesn't exist. You'd think, you'd think that Stewart could use his massive platform with liberals to push something that is so much the bare minimum. Instead, any time more progressive ideas are brought up, Stewart claims that this is a retraining that is too difficult to undergo. Like there are all of these people who are sort of put onto the margins of society because of the ways that we structured it and we can restructure it in a way that is better for the environment, yes, but it's also a better place for us to live in. And I think that's the message that we need to get across to people, that it's not just a message of sacrifice, but everything else will be better. It's a retraining though, Kendra, because it is, you know, to roll back that feeling of autonomy is a hard one while arguing that big oil can retrain themselves, I guess. So truthfully, in my mind, unless we can convince energy companies that they own a lot of this future, yeah. we can't make that transition 
with the speed that we need to make it with. <sighs> there are a ton of other ways that Stewart frames the issue of climate change that would make me want to pull my hair out if I had any left. He explains how fossil fuels have created enormous economic and technological growth. Climate change is an unintended consequence of our success as a species. We are crushing it. But in doing this, he doesn't really define who we is. The global north is definitely crushing it, but often at the expense of the global south. This is not just because poorer countries and those closer to the equator are the first to feel the effects of climate change, but also because those countries often suffered in order for the global north to crush it. In Nigeria, for example, oil spills and criminal negligence from Shell, the same company that he is interviewing here, have wrecked large swaths of the country's ecosystem. And wars over control of the Niger Delta have been crushing it in a different way. Oil has been a major driver of colonialism in human history, and certainly has been the cause of at least a few violent conflicts in Iraq over the past half century. This also makes the way Stewart presents the conversation around reducing emissions really frustrating. America's put more carbon in the atmosphere than any other country since the beginning of our Industrial Revolution. Like, we've powered a lot of this crisis. Yeah. And we have comfort second to none in the world. And now we're going to go to countries that are not as industrialized and say, I know you want the fridge to put your collagen peptides in. <laughs> but unfortunately, you don't get to have the advantage of industrialization that we did. No, John, nobody is making that argument in good faith. Nobody's, nobody's saying that. Most people in the climate change space are focused on curbing emissions from major polluters like the US, Europe, and China, rather than focusing on small potato countries that are in earlier stages of development. Come on, dude. All of this is really important context, and by framing climate change without it, the problem with Jon Stewart limits the scope of the problem and the scope of solutions for the show's audience. He could be using his platform to make people more ready to accept bigger solutions, but uh... That's, that's not what he chooses to do. But easily the worst part of the episode is his closing interview with Shell CEO Ben Van Bearden. I don't know if I said that right, and frankly, I don't care. That man doesn't deserve to have his name pronounced correctly. In the interview, Stuart lets him say all sorts of preposterous shit to avoid accountability. I think it is because of the, uh, the unbelievable complexity of the problem. And activists have the least amount of power in this equation. I disagree with you there. So if we are going to get to one and a half degrees by the end of this century, right. it may well be that by 2050, we are over one and a half degrees and we need the second half of the century to clean up. I'm losing my mind. I'm getting angry and I've already read this script. Like, I, I wrote it. I've watched all of this multiple times and I'm still angry about it. This, this is just egregious. This dude is literally saying, don't even worry about hitting benchmarks because we could just spend the second half of the century bringing temperatures back down. Apparently, climate change is very reversible, everybody, and nothing bad will happen in the meantime. No big deal. Drill, baby, drill. We're so fucked. I think that within the confines that Stewart is operating, he does hold Van dick faces, feet to the fire. Well, uh, let me not talk too much about API other than to say that we don't agree with them on everything and that we are- Aren't you on their working. board? Uh, yes, and we are working very hard to, of course, change the stance of the API in areas that we believe is important. But we are fiercely lobbying behind the scenes to make these <laughs> mandates work. And the problem is that there is no solution inside these artificial parameters that he's put upon himself. And we see this failure of framing across every episode. When he talks about gun control in another episode, he pitches taking guns away from domestic violence offenders. This is our sci-fi movie fix. Because if we simply kept guns away from domestic violence offenders, we could potentially stop 60% of mass shootings, 30% of child firearm deaths, more than 50% of women, 65%, 75%, oh, okay, I'm sorry, fuckload. But just can't seem to understand why the police don't support that. Federal law is that if you have a protection order or you have a restraining order or you've been convicted of domestic violence, you cannot own a firearm. True. Or ammunition. Or ammunition. Why is law enforcement not taking the lead and weeding out bad guys with guns? Maybe. 
just maybe, it's because domestic violence amongst police officers is two to four times higher than the general population. We know there have been studies doing, uh, done that show that for law enforcement themselves as people, there's higher incidence of domestic violence in their own homes. People don't want to say like, hey, I had a bad situation in my home that was violent and I'm right. worried like, that person's mad at me and they could use this law to take away my gun. And if that happens, I lose my job. Like there are all these other motivations going on. Instead, Stewart just accepts the presumption that cops are always good guys and then lets them say all sorts of batshit things in these interviews. Police are strapped in their budgets. That's a perfect example where an officer goes in, takes that gun out of there. And this person says, hey, you just violated my Fourth Amendment rights. You know, John, what are they making? You know, right. $60,000 a year. And now all of a sudden you're going to bankrupt this, this cop because they're trying to do the right thing to keep somebody safe. <sighs> Look, I could debunk all of these. I am the copaganda guy anyways. But you know what? I know you're all itching for more of that sweet, sweet copaganda content, so let's do a lightning round. Police budgets are gigantic and growing. Of the nearly dozen cities that made promises to cut funding in 2020 after George Floyd's murder, all of them now have higher police budgets than before they made those cuts. The ATF alone saw a 5.8% budget increase in 2020 and a whopping 19% increase in 2021. As for cops making 60K a year in Massachusetts, my home state, overtime scams have led to many state police officers making more than the governor some making over $350,000 annually. And I would hope I don't have to tell you why the Fourth Amendment thing is scary. That's what prevents the cops from just breaking into your house at any time. You know, in theory. <sighs> Man, that was refreshing. Kind of miss propaganda. Side note, we're very close on Patreon to reaching the threshold where I'll do an episode on Paw Patrol, so if you think I'm being harsh on human cops, just wait until they're filthy animals. <laughs> in every episode of The Problem, Stewart limits his own scope of the issues he's discussing because he doesn't seem to want to question the one thing that he continually is bumping up against, capitalism. So often he goes out of his way to avoid using the word capitalism. And when he does bring it up, he talks about it in a way that makes me honestly wonder if he, if he knows what capitalism is. So why isn't, competition more of a priority here versus uh letting we these don't companies... live in a free market capitalist system even though we pretend we do oh oh but we do john we absolutely live in a free market economy and this is the inevitable outcome of that system Obviously, there are gradations of capitalist economies and systems, but Stewart's common critique that we have socialism for the rich and capitalism for the poor, they socialize their losses and privatize their gains, is exactly how capitalism is designed to work. In a free market economy, wealth and power reinforce each other so that, over time, a small group controls the levers of governance. As Noam Chomsky told the nonprofit news organization Truth Out in 2016, and I'm sorry, this is a really long quote, but it sums up everything I'm talking about perfectly. Quote, Concentration of wealth leads naturally to concentration of power, which in turn translates to legislation favoring the interests of the rich and powerful and thereby increasing even further the concentration of power and wealth. What has just been described, that is, the vicious cycle of concentration of power and wealth, is so traditional that it is even described by Adam Smith in 1776. He says in his famous Wealth of Nations that, in England, the people who own society, in his days, the merchants and manufacturers are the principal architects of policy, and they make sure that their interests are very well cared for. However grievous the impact of the policies they advocate and implement through government is on the people of England or others. In that framework, our free market economy is operating exactly as designed. When can we have a free market capitalist system in this country? Well, we do have a capitalist what? system in this country. But not free market. Free market. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Wealth inequality is at historic levels in the United States, worse than during the French Revolution, all while corporate tax rates continue to be slashed and wages stagnate. Hey, maybe we should raise the minimum wage. Miss Cinema, Miss Cinema. No. This is the issue with Stewart's stance on nearly every issue that he tackles on his show, one that completely takes for granted that capitalism cannot or should not be challenged. If we go back to that podcast interview with Kendra Pierre Lewis, Stewart consistently conflates human nature with human nature under scarcity capitalism. I think you have more faith 
in humankind's ability to be preventative rather than reactionary. This is one of the things that I keep pushing back against. You're saying as a yeah. species, we're reactionary. That is incorrect. Americans are reactionary. I, I would honestly disagree. I would honestly disagree. Wait, there's a ton of psychological li literature about this because so much of psychology is based on Western, mostly American college students. It's, um, it's called weird, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, developed nations. And so we base our perception of what humankind is like on the subpopulation that actually, if you look at globally, is an anomaly. It's not the same. My girl Kendra is hitting the nail on the head. Stewart's framing of these issues is so often based on the assumption of a kind of capitalist state of nature. You see, the problem with climate change is really the problem with humans. Conflating capitalism with an immutable human characteristic is something we see Stuart struggling with throughout his commentary. Here he is talking about the news media. As unfortunately, if they are the one thing that stands between America and chaos, we are in trouble. Because rarely has there been an institution that has such a distance between its aspirations and its execution. But when your entire society is built on the concept of chasing profit, when the most important thing is to make money, how can you reasonably expect any company to compete while valuing something else? Sensationalism and polarization are natural outgrowths of a for-profit media industry. I think it's about systems. Like, well, listen, I'm in this system, and this is how the system is, and if I would like to get paid, continue to be paid the money that I'm making, which is seriously good money, do I really want to fight the system? The Real Housewives is a really good model. The reality show, right? This idea of the person who's willing to go there, go over the top, they become better known. They get paid more money. It's successful. Your guests who are willing to go over the top, the person who's willing to say the thing no one's willing to say, that person is good TV. If they're good TV, then they're going to get booked. How can it be any other way when this is our system? Yet, Stuart is constantly trying to find ways for that same system to fix itself. Can you do a profitable news organization that also is has the strength to cut through the noise in this media environment? I think once you identify this worldview, it's easy to see why his show feels flatter than it used to. He's not really speaking truth to real power structures. And all this makes me wonder, who is he talking to? It ain't me. Oh, oh wow, oh whoa. Did you look at that? We're on a we're on a new set. Certainly didn't put as much effort into this one. Um, but uh, I did wear this I did wear this shirt that feels very appropriate, so yeah. What's what's going on? Why are we in a new place? So I recorded this whole section where I talked about the perspective John Stewart brings to his commentary and the audience he's targeting. I talked about Stewart's conversations of race on The Daily Show and how he's taking major strides and is adding diversity to his writing staff. And I talked about how the problem still maintains the voice of a white liberal talking to a largely white liberal audience and that we can better understand why he's so dedicated to neoliberalism and capitalism if we take that context into account. For example, in that podcast with Kendra Pierre-Lewis, when she brings up how racism might have something to do with resistance to climate policy, he's legitimately taken aback. Why can't we use the money hose on people at the lower end of the economic ladder that have food insecurity, that have fuel insecurity? I, and I know why we can't. It's racism. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, so Talk to the me. easiest, <laughs> if you look at the United States and you look at Roosevelt, we had great social programs in place up until segregation. Once we got rid of segregation- Well, the New as, Deal as, though, it explicitly kept black people out of it. Right. And, the, and so it was fine to give people resources. And then the 1960s happened and we said, hey, we're going to start eroding these things. We're going to we're going to say that if you have a public pool, black people have to go into your pool. So they filled in the swimming pools and ma or made them private. Like, you can tell that he's never really thought about that before. That welfare policies meant to uplift the poor are consistently attacked because they might uplift black people too. Who, who would have thought? I talked about all sorts of stuff. It was great. 
You'll never see it, but it was great. And you can't argue with me because I'm the only one who's seen it. So you're just gonna have to take my word for it. So, so why not use it, you might ask? Well, the season finale of The Problem with Jon Stewart aired and it was titled, The Problem with White People. Yeah. Hold on, I'm just gonna, I'm just, I'm just gonna stop for a second and, and pose so you can get your memes out. I really didn't think it was fair to discuss Stuart and race and all that good stuff without addressing this huge thing he just did about it. So hopefully this doesn't feel like too big of a tone shift, but you know, I wasn't gonna reshoot the whole thing. Uh, who's, who's got time for that? <laughs> not, not me. I don't really even have time for this if I'm being completely honest. I need better time management skills. Anywho, let's go through this episode because there is a lot to unpack. The problem with white people lays out a pretty straightforward framework to talk about race. In the fallout of George Floyd's murder in 2020, white people decided that it was time to start listening. White people are pretending that this problem is new and we're just hearing about it now because we love to discover stuff that's already existed. <laughs> but the dirty little secret is that black people have been loudly explaining the systems of racism to white people for decades, centuries even. He said that in 1852. And now, 170 years later, suddenly we're like, hey, you seem upset. <laughs> Stewart points out that we, white people maybe need to take Toni Morrison's advice and talk amongst ourselves to tackle systemic racism. My feeling is white people have a very, very serious problem and they should start thinking about what they can do about it. Take me out of it. Now, I think Stewart does an excellent job of laying out how systemic racism exists in America. He brings up legislation and legal mechanisms that were designed to keep wealth away from black Americans and how the ripple effects of that disenfranchisement have continued today. It doesn't seem to matter what black people tell us or how many times they say it, it lands on deaf ears because a large swath of white America believes that black Americans are solely responsible for their community struggle. For as much as I've bashed Stewart's framing of issues in this video, I really like how the show sets up the problem in this episode, focusing on how things like segregation and the racial wealth gap persist due to institutional structures. And I really like how he continually hints at reparations, even though he knows that they might be politically controversial to his audience. Any real attempt to uh, rep rep repair a ton of that damage, reparation. This is a thing, this is an option. We, we could do this. Things get a little dicier when the panel begins. As Toni Morrison suggested, Stewart opts for an all white panel and his choices are certainly choices. He has a sociologist, cool. A woman from race to dinner, which is where wealthy white women pay $2,500 to be told that they're racist. Um, okay. And Andrew Sullivan, Blech. Now, if you're terminally online like me, then you might already know who Andrew Sullivan is. How to put this politely? Uh, he's a total fucking chode. Sullivan is a conservative British immigrant who likes to use his status as an immigrant to pontificate on immigration, spouts disgusting transphobia with JK Rowling, and is convinced that critical race theory is destroying America by making us aware that systemic racism didn't magically end when the Civil Rights Act was passed. By the way, why did these people always act like the Civil Rights Act ended racism while ignoring the fact that it was gutted by the Supreme Court in 2013? I mean, I know why, but... I'm not sure who invited Andrew Sullivan, but he does exactly what you'd expect Andrew Sullivan to do. He denies white supremacy in America and claims that talking about systemic racism is akin to calling every single individual white person an immoral person. You know, so that he doesn't have to talk about systems or context. Would your argument be that you don't believe that that's purposeful or that it doesn't exist? I don't believe it exists. Okay. I don't know what these systems are. Okay, so, so give me one here, system. All right, redlining neighborhoods. Capitalism? No, re redlining well, that's neighborhoods. A state, that is a, that was a state enforced thing from Jim Crow, which is the one point at which I think absolutely is true. So you just and said it doesn't beautiful. exist except for that. Now I think I understand what John and the team at The Problem are trying to do here. They're showing how a conversation about racism amongst white people can go, which isn't 
great. It's, uh, it's not great. We're very bad at talking about this. We've got to recalibrate and find a way to be open to all different uh, stripes of white people in the conversation, whether they be people who study it, uh, people who spend their lives trying to change it, or people who are very upset about having to do that. And I think there's certainly something to be said for exposing a different face of white supremacy to an audience that largely probably thinks of themselves as smart, educated, and well-meaning. You know, the good type of white people. Have the extreme racists, skinheads, KKK, most of all of Boston. Boom! Right here. If you didn't see yourself on the spectrum, that's the category you in, giving yourself the best white person award. Congratulations. And I think that in general, Stewart has made great strides as a commentator when it comes to race. Each episode of The Problem starts in the show's writer's room, one that is clearly more diverse in both race and gender. Each panel section platforms a diverse group of activists and experts on issues rather than bringing up white men for Stewart to argue with, except in this Andrew Sullivan case. This was actually a point of tension on The Daily Show during the second Obama administration. Correspondent and writer Wyatt Cenac recalled confronting Stewart on racial issues during the 2012 election and was told to fuck off. For those of you keeping score at home, that's two succession jokes. All bangers all the time. Yeah, all bangers all the time. And that's a third. Wyatt also took to Twitter last year to point out how the problem with Jon Stewart has a lot of eerie similarities to his own 2018 HBO product, Problem Areas with Wyatt Cenac. But if there's one thing I've learned, if you want somebody to take a black guy saying something meaningful on TV seriously, you really need to have a white guy say basically the same thing right after. <laughs> Throughout the rest of his run on The Daily Show, Stewart started to tackle racial issues in a more head-on fashion, as movements like Black Lives Matter gained steam following the murders of Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, and Eric Garner. A grand jury in New York City has decided not to charge a white New York City police officer in the death of an unarmed African-American man. I, 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 just, I don't know. I, re I honestly don't know what to say. If, if, uh, if comedy is tragedy plus time, I need more time, but I would really settle for less tragedy, to be honest with you. We are definitely not living in a post-racial society, and I can imagine there are a lot of people out there wondering how much of a society we're living in at all. Stewart even brought on Bill O'Reilly to challenge him on the idea of white privilege in one of the few interviews with O'Reilly that might have maybe actually not been the worst thing ever? Let me just ask you a question. Yes. Did that upbringing leave a mark on you even today? Of course. Every upbringing me Great. leaves a mark on Great. people. Could black people live in Levittown? Not at that time. <laughs> they could not. And I think that in some ways, what Stewart is trying to do here with Sullivan is to use him as an example and expose his racial dog whistles by asking very simple follow-up questions. You're not talking about everybody. That's a lot of our problems. You're talking about I black am, people. But, Why but, do you think you seem to feel like somehow black culture is uniquely destructive to family? Why? I don't, I don't, to be honest with you, I'm just telling you that's what is the truth. <laughs> but I also think it's important to think even more critically about audiences here. Immediately after this panel discussion, Andrew Sullivan took to his Twitter and his Substack, what a cursed social media combo, to talk about how he had been ambushed. He thought Stewart was a reasonable man who believed in things like sanity, but then he was catering to the woke mob with critical race theory, blah, 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 blah. blah. Honestly, I'm torn. On the one hand, I think it was probably good to watch seemingly benign talking points exposed for the racist foundation that they're built on. Those can definitely be intentional, but I think that for many well-meaning white people, they've heard these arguments made only in their dog whistle form and have never really stopped to think about them or what they're saying or try to understand what they're really implying. You're talking about a narrow band of people who harbor racial resentment. No, I I'm talking about the majority of people, they don't harbor racial resentment, but they'll say, well, there's, there's more crime there right. in the black community. And if you keep saying to them, but why? They won't come to, well, redlining yes. and the Homestead Act. Yes. What they'll come to is the culture. On the other hand, I'm not sure Stewart needed to have Sullivan on his show in order to do that. I'm not sure the show needed to give him space to claim victimhood. Bigoted ideas like racism and transphobia aren't defeated with logic, 
they can only be starved of attention and air. The systems that were racist that were put in place. That systems. Yes. The systems that were put in place. I'd like you to explain exactly what they are. Well, I thought I explained it earlier about the GI Bill and about what, the that's, New that's Deal. That's very simple. That's one thing. I want to know about these systems. I just explained it. Housing. That's food, one, and I've agreed right. that. Andrew, you're not living on the same what? fucking planet we are. Honestly. For Stewart's audience, he won. But for Sullivan's audience, he got to come out looking like a man who was bullied for speaking his demented version of reality. And ever since Andrew Sullivan got destroyed, the far-right media apparatus has been turning John's commentary about white people into content for their base, saying how he's the actual racist because he's singling out white people, and then he's been brainwashed by woke leftists because he dared to say that maybe white supremacy has something to do with white people, I guess. Pro tip. You can see who's a bad faith commentator here by the amount of anti-Semitism and transphobia in their YouTube comments. So yeah, I'm, I'm torn. Tell me in the comments where I went wrong. I won't read them, but that never seems to slow you guys down anyways. But even still, we see Stewart kind of gloss over capitalism as part of this system. He does a good job of explaining how black Americans were made poor through systemic choices, but he stops short of pointing out how this trend and many of the other trends he's talking about perpetuate themselves. He mentions the racial wealth gap, sure, but he doesn't really go into how or why it keeps growing. And yet, even after all that, the wealth gap, worse now. Homeownership, worse now. Segregation, worse now. On average, a white high school graduate is wealthier than a black college graduate. You know, like all the other wealth inequality we talked about earlier. You see, Stewart has this really bad habit of going from what's happening to how can we fix it and kind of ignoring the why is it happening in the meantime. I'm always finding myself pausing the problem with Jon Stewart to put my head in my hand and plead with him to just ask why. Just just ask why these problems exist, John. Walmart makes billions in profits and can distribute it to its shareholders. And that's just how it goes. But we know that we, the taxpayers, are subsidizing their workforce with food stamps. They're getting the benefit of our tax dollars. So it's, it's not free market. But, but John, that's what the free market does. It consolidates wealth and power at the top over time so that the entire system serves capital above all else. People might not realize that many of the, the regulatory structures in the market are self-regulatory. Okay, so you have... Self-regulatory meaning you guys handle this? Yes. Like baseball arbitration. Yes, same, same right? Same so like the, the stock exchanges, for example, are for-profit, publicly traded companies who set the rules for both their exchanges and the market overall, and then they're the ones charged... What, what do you mean, what? That's the free market you're always talking about wanting. Wouldn't it be better to hold our noses, to not villainize them, to understand that no industry is ever going to cut its own throat and take away its profits. Then maybe we can't use profit incentives to fix this problem, John. So as long as the delta, the, the, the ratings increase from yesterday, uh, keeps going, you're going to obviously keep doing that story, but you've got to milk it a little bit more. You know, you get a minute-by-minute minute ratings printout. <laughs> you know exactly You get a minute-by-minute ratings, minute ratings printout at CNN. It's everywhere, not just at CNN. Why do you think that is, John? This is what happens in a for-profit media environment. It's wild because sometimes you can actually hear Stewart acknowledge these things in his podcast. Do you remember there was a woman that testified in Congress about Facebook? Oh, that's right, the yeah. whistleblower. Frances Haugen, and she said, Facebook puts profits over people. And I was like, hmm, wait till she finds out about every corporation known to man, uh, that that's kind of their thing. Like, how can you say that and then also ask private industry to fix gigantic systemic problems that they profit off of and think that it'll work? Honest, honestly, honest, honestly, how do you think that? How can you identify that our current structure values profits over all other values and then try to shame companies into fixing things like climate change or the news media? When I watch the problem with Jon Stewart, I start to feel like a real left-wing nut job. Maybe you think I am, I don't know. Because I constantly find myself asking this stuff. It always feels like he's circling around the bigger problem of 
capitalism and its effects. These big systemic problems. Maybe I'm being too hard on John, maybe too radical. I mean, what do I want him to do? Do I want him to just renounce capitalism? Yes, actually, yeah, yes. Is it, that's an option? Of course, I'm not asking John Stewart to spark the revolution or for capitalism to be dismantled overnight. I understand that he's trying to advocate for changes that are possible within that system since they could actually help people right now. And I really think that's a noble goal. I really, I really do, I really do. I know it sounds like I hate everything, but I, I think that that's good. Look at me being positive. And frankly, I think the problem with white people addresses some of the biggest problems I have with Jon Stewart's new show. Here, he foregrounds systemic issues and calls them out by name, all while hinting at an even more progressive idea, reparations that are probably the best solution. The truth is, America has always prioritized white comfort over black survival. Black people have had to fight so hard for equality that they've been irreparably set back in the pursuit of equity. In fact, this episode kind of makes me feel bad for criticizing him because I, I certainly don't want to be on the side of those Andrew Sullivan types. I, I think it's clear by this point that I'm not, but um, I'm not. But at the same time, I think Stewart could take the same approach he took to systemic racism and just take it a hair further to talk about capitalism, to acknowledge the systems that perpetuate problems while still staying focused on harm reduction and short-term solutions. Like, just acknowledge them. Just acknowledge, acknowledge it. Just pay the smallest amount of lip service to, to, to capitalism. Just, you did it with systemic racism, just do it with capitalism. They're, they're all part of the same system. Racism and capitalism, hard to separate, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah, because Something only has value if uh, something else has less value. Yeah, I feel like any way you can buy a can of Coke, some type of racism going kind of down there. I actually think John Oliver has done a great job of carving out this exact space. Like when he talked about sex work and how to make it safer. To those who are still uncomfortable here, out of a concern that there are people who feel economically forced into sex work, I totally agree with you. That is a huge problem, but the fact is, our current laws are not addressing that. If you want to do that, that's a much bigger conversation to have because fundamentally, the only way to make sure that people have a choice in the way they earn money is to make housing affordable, healthcare accessible, and to not burden marginalized people with criminal records that lead to a cycle of joblessness, homelessness, and desperation. But until such time. I think that it makes sense that John Oliver's approach kind of filled Stuart's shoes when he left The Daily Show. That's not to say that Oliver is perfect or anything like that, but I do think that his show is much better at two things that Stuart is woefully bad at. The first is that he's much better at activating his audience on issues. Over the years, John Oliver has a history of creating energy for an overlooked issue over the course of his program, and then turning that energy into activism through a stunt at the end. He's pointed out how ridiculously corrupt the predatory lending industry is by buying $15 million worth of medical debt for just $60,000 and forgiving it. He's raised awareness for net neutrality by making the petition site gofccyourself.com. He's written a children's book called Last Week Tonight with John Oliver Presents A Day in the Life of Marlon Bundo to combat Mike Pence's support for conversion therapy, which raised millions of dollars for the Trevor Project and AIDS United. That is a much more concrete difference to make than getting a bunch of liberals to show up to the rally to restore sanity. You'd, you'd be doing a nice thing in a really dickish way. And isn't that the dream at the end of the day? The other thing Oliver is much better at identifying is the larger systemic context and making it explicit. I think that Stewart often identifies the right issues and walks up to pointing out the systems that perpetuate them, but stops short of calling them out. Still, it's hard to listen to what Stewart says and not want to take that last extra little step. And maybe that's intentional. Like the way Will Smith teaches Kevin James to kiss in the classic movie Hitch. Hitch fans out there, anybody? Nobody? Okay. The secret to a kiss is to go 90% of the way and then hold for her to come the other 10. Stewart doesn't want to go as far as saying capitalism is the problem. He really likes the free market. But it's not hard to see how his audience is going to go that extra 10%. How can you look at the problems the way he's laying them out and not think that profit and capitalism are root issues in things like the climate crisis or the media? Can you do a profitable news organization 
that also is, has the strength to cut through the noise in this media environment. It's almost impossible really today. Maybe I'm being too hard on Jon Stewart. I probably am. I mean, who the fuck am I? I'm just a fucking YouTuber. He is going after the right people broadly. He's making it clear to his audience the ways in which the system is rigged against working people by the ruling class. Maybe what I'm saying isn't really all that different than the tone policing thrown towards the left. After all, a lot of the people commenting on his clips on YouTube and Reddit are extrapolating out the brokenness of capitalism. And there's nothing wrong with incrementalism on its own. All changes happen in parts. The problem comes when those incremental changes are seen as enough. That the problem has been solved. That he focuses his audience on symptomatic issues, driving interest for them that dissipates after they're solved, if they're even solved at all. If you're watching The Problem with Jon Stewart on Apple TV Plus in 2022, you probably already believe most of the things he's preaching. He's not pushing you to deconstruct anything, he's just moderating you to work within the neoliberal context you're used to. Do I want vets to have medical care for burn pit exposure? Yeah, I want them to have health care for everything. I want to stop needlessly putting them in harm's way. I want to stop scamming people into joining the military so that they can have access to health care and an education because this country is too broken to provide for its citizens. I want to help burn pit victims just as much as Jon Stewart. I just wish he could tie these energies together and build a coalition. Because he has the platform to do it. I think that it makes sense that so many people who have been influenced by Jon Stewart are making content and commentary that's further to the left than he was, going that extra 10% to point out systemic issues and foreground them. That's John Oliver, sure, but that's also Patriot Act. And as long as there are people with so much money and so much power, we'll have no say. The only real solution here is making sure that they're not that rich in the first place. That means closing loopholes, more IRS oversight, and especially taxing that ass. It's YouTube channels like Some More News. It's other long form video essayists using entertainment and comedy to engage with an audience while pointing them towards underlying structures that hold these symptomatic problems. I mean, hey, I grew up watching Jon Stewart on The Daily Show. My dad and I would watch the 7 p.m. reruns every night with dinner. I was raised on that commentary. And now here I am making content talking about how he's a centrist piece of shit. He's a centrist who doesn't go far enough. It's the circle of life, I guess. I think part of the reason the problem with Jon Stewart feels out of touch is because we've outgrown him. The people who grew up watching him are done walking up to symptoms and are ready to identify and call out things like capitalism and neoliberalism. We're living in the world Jon Stewart created, but I think that he's got some catching up to do if he wants to find a place in it for himself. Now, I didn't get to talk about all of the things that I promised at the end of my last video, or all the things that I've researched, especially about his terrible 2020 election movie. Their money is the problem? Oh, you should have seen their faces. I saw. They ate it up. We could have named our price. <laughs> if you want that kind of stuff, you can head over to Patreon and become a patron. Patreon gives you access to all sorts of other stuff, like Q&As, TV roundups, early access to videos, your name in the credits, and probably a breakdown of that movie, because boy, it's cringy. You can head over to patreon.com slash skip intro to join the skip intro hive? Yeah, we'll go with that. And bring us closer and closer to that elusive Paw Patrol video. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, like, share, and subscribe, and I'll talk at you next time. Please subscribe, subscribe.